Thank you and good evening. And welcome to those here and those joining at home. This is the 43rd People's Question Time, our first ever hybrid event, and the first time we've welcomed an in-person audience since March 2020. It's also my first People's Question Time since being elected as the London Assembly member for Barnet and Camden in May of this year. This is the second time that this event has been held in Camden, and this is the 11th People's Question Time for the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. It's great to see so many of you here tonight. A special welcome to the volunteers who are helping. Take, they're, they're gonna be helping, they're gonna have paddles tonight and taking your questions. Also a special welcome to the Deputy Mayors and the Mayor of Camden, Sabrina Francis. I'd also like to welcome representatives from the police and the fire brigade. I have just a few brief announcements before I introduce the London Assembly and the Mayor. And then I will take your questions. The Mayor and the London Assembly work to improve life of Londoners and to make London an even better place. People's Question Time is your chance to voice your concerns and ask the Mayor and the London Assembly members what we are doing for the capital and its people. Please, first welcome to the stage your London Assembly members. And now, please welcome the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. We will be taking questions on the following topics tonight, and each section will have 18 minutes. The topics are transport, policing and safety, air quality and the environment, housing, London's economic recovery, and anything else not already covered. Questions about COVID-19 will be taken throughout the event in whichever section they fit best. If you pre-registered to watch the event at home, you will be able to submit questions throughout the event. Please note that the chat function is for questions only and that comments will not be published. Try to ask questions on the topic being discussed at the time, otherwise they will be skipped. You may also like each other's questions online. For each topic, we will begin with one online question, followed by two live questions. If we have time for additional questions, they will be taken from the live audience. We have allocated 18 minutes for each subject and 15 minutes at the end. I ask you to please keep your questions short so that we can get to as many of you as possible. Please ask questions rather than make statements. And I also ask the mayor and the assembly members to keep their answers short and to the point so that we can fit in as many questions as possible. Please listen to the questions and answers with respect and dignity and do not heckle or disrupt the meeting. Please complete a feedback form which can now be done online. The link will be displayed on the screen at the end of tonight's event, and there are QR codes dotted around, which you may scan as well. Your electronic devices should already be on silent, and the same applies to the mayor and the assembly members. And now, we will have a few introductory words from the deputy chair of the London Assembly, and then the mayor. Can I welcome the deputy chair of the London Assembly, Keith Prince, who will give his opening address. Well, good evening, Camden, and thank you very much for hosting us. It's very kind of you. 
So I just want to give you a bit of background. So the role of the London Assembly is not only to hold the mayor to account, but also to investigate issues that matter to you. We are your voice at City Hall. With that in mind, we have been busy in recent months on your behalf. Earlier this year, the Environment Committee published a report making 10 recommendations on what the mayor can do to clean up the air for millions of Londoners. It also recently looked at how you might mitigate the risks of flooding in the capital. The Health Committee wrote to the Mayor asking what he was doing to help those who are living with long COVID. The Committee also published a report into the provision of public toilets in the capital. The Housing Committee undertook a survey which looked into Londoners' housing situations and attitudes to their homes as a result of COVID-19. The Committee wrote to the Government to call on them to abolish Section 21 the clause in the Housing Act that allows private landlords to evict tenants without reason. The Police and Crime Committee investigated how to reduce violence as lockdown was eased and how prepared London is for possible future terrorist attacks. The Economy Committee focused on how severely London's tourism industry and nighttime economy have been affected by the pandemic. The Oversight Committee has investigated the policies and processes around the payment of sponsorship money and invitations to mayoral trade missions. The Transport Committee has been keeping a close eye on TfL's finances and continues to question Crossrail about when the rail link will finally be up and running. It has also published a recent report about the poor state of London's ageing river crossings, that's the bridges and the tunnels, and how they are maintained and funded. <coughs> And finally, you may remember back in 2019, we asked you, the people of London, to nominate 100 female Londoners who deserved the recognition of a blue plaque. Back then, only 14% of blue plaques in the capital honoured women. We thought that was wrong. The response was overwhelming, and we handed a list of over 250 names to English heritage, thanks to Londoners' suggestions. And very proudly, in September this year, English Heritage unveiled a blue plaque from one of your suggestions. That was to the memory of Diana, the Princess of Wales. So well done. Marvellous landmark, that. So you can keep up with our work by following us on Twitter, at London Assembly. And if you're really suffering from insomnia, you can watch the meetings on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblymember Prince. May, may I invite the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, to give his opening address. Thank you, uh, Anne, and uh, thank you, uh, Keith, uh, good evening and uh, welcome to this uh, hybrid version of uh, People's uh, Question Time. It's good to be back at Congress House and good to be back in Camden. And it's great to be in front of an audience uh, once again, but also to have so many people join us online as well. This event is about you. It's your chance to put your questions to me and Assembly members about the work we're doing from City Hall on your behalf. Since I was elected in 2016, we've shown that even under the most difficult of circumstances, progress is possible. From reducing toxic air pollution by nearly half in central London, to starting a record number of new, genuinely affordable homes, including council homes. From making transport more affordable for millions of Londoners, to creating countless positive opportunities for young people thanks to new investment from City Hall. I'm proud of the strides we've taken as a city. But as we continue to recover from this terrible pandemic, there's clearly much more to do. In the short term, we're working flat out to help kickstart London's economy, protecting and creating jobs, and banging the drum for our city 
both at home and around the world to attract the jobs, business and investment we need. We've announced £544 million of investment to boost our economy and support jobs. We've launched the Let's Do London campaign to attract Londoners and people from across the UK to support our cultural and hospitality sectors by coming to make the most of what our great city has to offer. And we've launched a new initiative to ensure unemployed and low-paid Londoners can retrain for free. At the same time, we're determined to continue tackling the long-standing issues that matter most to Londoners. These include tackling violence and making London safer, building more affordable homes and helping renters, and taking action to tackle the twin emergencies of climate change and air pollution. The pandemic has not only exposed, but exacerbated some of the deep-seated inequalities in our city that have been tolerated for far too long. As we recover, I want to help level the playing field. That's why the common thread that continues to run through everything I do as mayor is my commitment to create a fairer, more equal and more just city for all Londoners, irrespective of race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, disability or class. I'll never forget that London gave me the opportunities to go from a council estate to being mayor of the greatest city in the world. And I still wake up every morning passionate about delivering my promise to Londoners, to make London a fairer city where all Londoners get the opportunities that our city gave to me and my family. Let me end and by saying this, recovering from this pandemic isn't going to be easy, but I'm optimistic about our future because I know that when we come out of this crisis for good, which we will, we'll continue to be a city that can build on all our achievements in recent years, we'll continue to be the best, most dynamic, most amazingly diverse, most innovative and exciting city in the world, and we'll continue to be a city that puts the dark days of the pandemic behind us so that we can build a better and brighter future for all Londoners. I'm looking forward to this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It is now time to take your questions. Our first topic is transport, and we have 18 minutes for this section. I will take questions in threes. The first question comes from the live chat, and then I'll take two from the, from the audience. The first question from the live chat, we haven't seen these before, so they come up on this iPad. Mr. Mayor, why can't you return things as they were? before when, 60, when, when over 60s workers were using their TFL pass to get to work and not spending extra money before nine or half nine, as we now are, that we have things, the pandemic, under control. And that qu question comes from Augustino in Islington. And I'll take two questions from the audience. Um, the first one, can I take from number two, could you see uh, the guest with the blue jumper in the second row? Um, speaking as a Londoner who has a disability and relies heavily on a car, I have noticed throughout Camden and many other boroughs that d disabled parking spaces are being removed or moved further from you know, the useful point of entry. So as an example, Tottenham Court Road, just around the corner, if you have a disabled car, there's no way you can stop in front of one of the furniture stores just to nip in. They've all been moved, you know, several meters back. Additionally, 
I notice, I mean, I live in Camden, so I can speak about Camden. Most of the new developments that are being developed are car free. So therefore, if you, have a disa you, know, if you are disabled, or more importantly, if you become disabled whilst living in one of these developments, you will not be able to use a car. My father has a building company. He is now finding that his staff who have to use vans are unable to park their car to can store we, their tools. Can we, can we so, come yeah. to the question? Yeah, yeah. So the question is, what are you doing to make sure that whilst you're cleaning up the air in London, you're making provision for workers and uh, disabled drivers who need their cars? And also, what's happening with the charging points? Okay. Thank you. And the third question, could I take... Um, the guest who's just sitting with his hand up right next to uh, pedal three. I'm a licensed black taxi driver of 22 years and have a question regarding the de decommissioning of my vehicle. I purchased my TX4 taxi new in 2009, a time when there was no limit placed on the working life of black taxis. I had the intention of working it for at least 15 years and invested time and money in it over the past 12 years to keep it, word, to keep it roadworthy. Between the Mayor's office uh, and can COVID... We, can we come to the question? Thank you. Okay, I'm here to ask the Mayor's office to give back the crucial three years so that I can keep working to plan. Okay, thank you for those. Um, Mr Mayor, we have three questions for you. Great, Thank, thanks, Mr Chair. Th thanks for all those questions, and thanks also to the live chat question uh, as well. So one of the things that, that we know, because of the uh, pandemic, Londoners have followed the government advice and uh, didn't travel during uh, the uh, lockdown and during the pandemic unless they were key workers and had to travel. And uh, roughly speaking, 72% of the income uh, that TfL uh, uses to provide services come from fares that commuters uh, pay, but clearly, as there are fewer people using public transport, the fares plummeted, and so TfL ran out of money, even though we'd reduced the deficit by more than 71% in the previous four years and increased our cash balances. So the government gave us uh, uh, some finances to help us out, but attached conditions to those finances, and one of the conditions they attached was we had to remove free travel for children, and uh, they wanted us to take away free travel from those above the age of 60. I said, no, I'm not willing to uh, do that. Uh, one of the things that we had to do, uh, notwithstanding me saying no to removing free travel for chil from children and those above the age of 60, was to agree to remove free travel below 9 a.m. And that's the reason why, for those above the age of 60, they can still use their free travel for the rest of the day, but not during the rush hour. And the main reason for that is because uh, the government, and I support them with this, wants to free up the rush hour uh, commuter lines uh, for those who are going to work to make sure we can try and keep social uh, uh, distancing. The government still wants us to remove, by the way, free travel for children and above the age of 60, uh, but as long as I'm there, they're going to stay. In relation to the question from uh, the disabled at Londoner, she asked two questions. Uh, one is just, just to remind colleagues, um, uh, thank you for your question, by the way, uh, that 95% of the roads in our great city are under the control of the 32 boroughs and City of London. Uh, so I can't answer questions about specific boroughs. Uh, but 5% are controlled by uh, TfL and uh, therefore by me as the chair of uh, TfL. Legislation requires us to make sure that there's disabled spots and new developments. So even though there are so-called car-free developments, there are still parking bays for disabled residents uh, who, visit, who live in those uh, homes. We're also required, rightly by legislation, to make sure the doorways are wide enough and so forth and so forth. So if there is a development in Camden, a new development that doesn't have disabled parking, if you could, this front row is people who work in City Hall, have a word and I can speak to Camden Council to look into what's gone on because that clearly uh, can't be right. Um, and the same goes in relation to proximity to shops. They're required to be parking bays near to those. I have members of my family who are disabled, uh, so I understand the challenges it poses. So if you speak to my team, I'll taste up the Camden examples you gave. Charging points you raised a really good point. How can we encourage people to buy electric vehicles if they haven't got confidence they can charge their vehicles, right? And so we've got to increase hugely the amount of charging points in our city. And here's the good news. Over the last uh, four or five years, we've increased hugely both charging points 
and rapid charging points. We now have a rapid charging points of those commercial drivers. Think of a black taxi, a uh, plumber, so forth, who can't afford to spend 45 minutes charging their car. They, they've got work to do. Uh, and they, these take about 15 minutes. Uh, we've now got uh, more rapid charging points than any city in Western Europe, uh, almost 400. And uh, we now have uh, more than 7,500 ordinary charging points, about a third of the country's charging points, and we're going to continue ramping up the charging infrastructure for uh, our city. Uh, the other question was from the black cab uh, driver uh, in relation to support uh, for uh, an extension of the scrappage scheme uh, rather than being uh, uh, 12 years for it to be 15 years. Look, the, the big issue we have is uh, one of the reasons why the area in our city is toxic is because of the, the fumes that come from vehicles uh, which put out NOx, uh, particulate matter, uh, as well as, of course, we know about carbon. And so what we've introduced is uh, a scrappage scheme uh, to support black taxis uh, who have older vehicles, but also an electric vehicle grant and the electric vehicle grant allows you to get a reduction in relation to buying a uh, new uh, taxi. As it is, uh, the money we have, uh, TfL runs out on December the 11th with the government, and so we're negotiating with the government in relation to a new financial deal. But I wouldn't hold, I wouldn't hold out, sir, for the criteria changing. It will still be the case if your car is older than 12 years, uh, you'll need to move to a less polluting vehicle, because we're keen to make sure uh, the area in our city isn't leading to what it currently does, which is 4,000 premature deaths a year, children with uh, stunted lungs forever, and adults with a whole host of health issues from asthma to cancer, from dementia to heart disease. Thank you. We have nine minutes left. Uh, if I said at the beginning, we will not accept heckling. If there is any heckling, you'll be asked to leave. So please stop. I'm not having it. Thank you. We have time for two more questions. Um, could I take a question um, number two? Uh, just to your right, there's a, a guest behind you with his hand up. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, um, I'm just curious as to the plans that you may or may not have um, for Formula One to come to London. And on the back of that, if Formula One is coming to London, how on earth are you justifying the congestion charge that is affecting people in the ULES zone that people who are on benefits are not able to swap their vehicles, and on top of that, people who want to apply for the exemptions that did exist in the congestion charge zone can't now do so. Uh, and that consultation, I understand, has been going on for over a year. Thank you. Now, the, the, the gentleman there raised a really important question, which I understand is a challenge. I, I understand the, the, the challenge, the congestion charge changes have put on uh, Londoners. So one of the terms of the deal with the government, I mentioned under 16s travel and those above the age of 60, one of the terms was we had to immediately reintroduce the congestion charge, which I suspended during the uh, lockdown and the pandemic, but also had to widen the scope and the fee. So it went from being five days a week from 7 a.m. till 6 p.m. paying £11.50 to being seven days a week from 6 a.m. till 10 p.m. and £15. So this summer began a consultation for 10 weeks uh, to take it back to uh, 6 p.m. Uh, during the weekdays. Uh, for the weekends not to be until 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., but between just 12 and 6, uh, but to keep the 15 pounds charge. That consultation ended on the 6th of October, and I'm sure you responded, sir. Uh, TfL are currently looking at those responses. We received almost 10,000 responses. They'll look at all those responses, every single one, There'll then be a report prepared for me, and I'll decide what to do going uh, forward. I'm keen to go as soon as I can and to introduce any changes as soon as I can, because I understand how some Londoners who need to drive uh, the current temporary system isn't uh, working. And I hope to bring a response back, Chair, as soon as possible in relation to the permanent uh, change. And I just make this one point. Since I've been mayor uh, in 2016, uh, before the uh, pandemic, uh, the, the condition charge didn't go up at all didn't go up at all, so it's been the same level since 2014. The previous two mayors increased it twice uh, during their terms as uh, a mayor, so I've kept it frozen up until the uh, pandemic, but I'm consulting in relation to a permanent change, and I'll come back as soon as I can to announce what I've decided. Thank you. And, and I know that Assembly Member Pigeon, you wanted to come in briefly on that, because we are out of time, so just, just quick. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to pick up as uh, Chair of the Transport Committee, um, we've had a lot around congestion, tackling congestion, tackling pollution. Um, the ultra-low emission zone is a really bold policy, 
but I think having Formula One come to London alongside it sends out the wrong message, which picks up the point that was raised earlier. But what's really important is the Mayor has put some money in to help people clean up their vehicles. We want to see money coming from government as well alongside that. But what I've been encouraging the Mayor as a Liberal Democrat is instead of encouraging people to clean up their vehicle by swapping it for another, to look at mobility credits. Could we look at credit on an Oyster car? Could you look at a car club membership, a bike hire membership, something like that? So we're actually trying to get cleaner vehicles and fewer vehicles on our streets in London. I'm really hoping going forward we can look at progressive policies like that to tackle both congestion and the pollution in our city. Thank you. Okay, and we are now out of time on transport. If we didn't get to your question, please do visit People's Question Time Kansan on the london.gov website, which tells you how you can submit a question in writing. So we'll now move on to our next section, which is policing and safety. We have 18 minutes on this topic, and this includes any questions about community safety, policing, and the London Fire Brigade. I will take the first question again from the online audience. And the first question is, uh, it's from Amar in Barnett, and he's asking, how is, the how, how is the mayor supporting initiatives tackling violence against women and girls, and sexual violence in particular? Would the mayor support implementing more lighthouses in London to help respond to this problem? And I'll take two questions from the audience. Could we get a question nearest number one, four people in? Thank you. You spoke about reducing violence in London. My question is, what are we doing as a black Muslim woman you know, with black brothers, what are we doing to increase the accountability amongst the police force when the perpetrators of those violence come from the people that are supposed to protect us? Not only... So, like I said, this year we have seen a blatant example of how the police are the perpetrators, especially with the unfortunate murder of Zara Everand. And I want to know what London and the mayor is doing to increase accountability and, you know, in the past, there's been excuses of you know not enough evidence and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I think we can no longer go along that trope. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And the third question: Can I get the guest um, number one? I'm picking you on again um, over there nearest the edge. Thank you. Hi there. I'm a teacher in Camden. Uh, and my question is, I'm really worried about the safety of many of the young people in my care. I'm a secondary teacher, um, and I want to know how the mayor is working with the councils and others to support young people away from violence. Thank you so much. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, over to you with those three questions. Yeah, th thank you very much for all, th all those questions. So first, let me deal with Omar's question from uh, Barnett, the online uh, audience member. So, so Omar, so... Um, one of the things we've done since 2016 is to <clears throat> invest record sums to support women and girls who are the victims of uh, violence. And the scheme you mentioned, the Lighthouse scheme, is the one we fund from City Hall. It's actually in Camden, and I've been to visit Lighthouse. What Lighthouse is, is basically a, a one-stop uh, place for children in particular who are the victims of sexual abuse and uh, uh, violence. And rather than going from pillar to post, seeing uh, the police, then seeing an expert, then seeing an examiner, then seeing a social worker, you can see all these people in one place. And it's proved to be really successful, including seeing a psychologist and uh, so forth. So we funded this in 2018, and the idea was to fund it for a couple of years to persuade the Home Office to carry on funding it. The Home Office uh, have said, said, said would decline initially, so we've extended the funding uh, uh, for another year. And so we're hoping, Omar, to persuade the Home Office to support this lighthouse going forward because it's proved to be a huge uh, uh, success in relation to supporting victims, but also making sure the perpetrators are properly put, brought to book, because although we've got to support victims and survivors, we've got to tackle the uh, perpetrators and their behavior. Uh, it's really important that we get successful convictions so, they, so justice can be done, so they can't harm any more young people as uh, well. And I'm hoping Omar to have some good news in relation to Lighthouse going uh, forward. Can I thank uh, the, the, the lady in the audience who asked a really important question uh, that is at the fore, I know, of many Londoners' uh, mind, which is the issue of trust and confidence in the uh, police who we look to 
to protect us and uh, keep us uh, safe. And there have been a number of examples uh, which have led to Londoners uh, having less trust and confidence than we need to in a society where we police by consent. Uh, how can we encourage people to come forward and report crime or to be a witness in prosecution or to join the police service if they haven't got confidence in that police service? So it's an issue that affects all of us as a society, uh, not just Sarah Everard's case where a serving police officer was responsible for her abduction, uh, uh, rape, uh, uh, murder, and then setting her body on fire. But also we've had recently an example of two police officers pleading guilty to uh, taking photographs uh, with Bieber Henry and Nicole Smallman and the findings of the IRPC in relation to the service uh, Mina that the mother received from the police. And there's currently an inquest taking place uh, into the uh, murders committed by Stephen Port in relation to uh, gay men in London. And so there are concerns in relation to misogyny, uh, sexism, racism, and uh, homophobia. So a number of things we're doing to try and earn back that trust and confidence working with the police. Uh, uh, during the summer of the pandemic, uh, when George Floyd was brutally murdered in Minnesota, Minneapolis, uh, we began uh, listening to communities to come up with an action plan, how to improve trust and confidence, particularly amongst the black communities in the uh, police service. Uh, for example, recruiting more black officers, making sure the community is involved in training our police, getting the community involved in relation to uh, working with the police, uh, but also looking at policy around handcuffing, uh, stop and search, and uh, so forth. In relation to the concerns raised after Sarah Everard's uh, brutal uh, murder, uh, the police have asked Dame Louise Casey to look into what lessons need to be learned in relation to police practice, and the Home Secretary yesterday announced an inquiry led by QC in relation to uh, any opportunities missed in relation to the police officer who killed Sarah Everard and how we can make sure uh, the police is free from misogyny, misogyny sexism, racism, and uh, homophobia. But these are really important issues uh, that I don't, don't under underestimate at all the importance of getting to uh, the bottom of this because if we have, haven't, confidence in the, haven't got confidence in the police, uh, that's a big problem for society uh, generally. And can I thank the teacher firstly for being a teacher and for the service you give to our young people across uh, our city. Uh, two members of our family are teachers and how incredibly hard you uh, work. So look, serious youth violence has been going up since uh, 2013. I've spent too many times meeting bereaved families who've lost a child, but also speaking to young people who've been the victims of uh, crime. And uh, I think what you're experiencing are, are the consequences of 11 years of uh, cuts, not just in the police, but also in after school clubs, in youth centres, in constructive things for young people to do. So what we've got in London is a public health approach towards addressing the issue and keeping your students safe uh, outside the school in particular. Uh, and so we have England's first uh, violence reduction unit. So we're supporting communities, young people, uh, after school clubs in education, in culture, in sports. We're now funded more than 300 uh, youth clubs across London, uh, supporting 120,000 young people. It's really important to keep young people busy rather than uh, you know, uh, getting involved in um, uh, criminality, criminal gangs, uh, antisocial behaviour and so forth. That can happen. Uh, I think young people generally are demonised and generalised and we shouldn't. And the other thing we're doing uh, with the violent Traction Unit is supporting communities and supporting teachers. So if a young person in school is at risk of being excluded or that transition from primary school to secondary school, how can we support that young person with peers and with mentors and we're training up our youth workers to make sure that they can support young people. We can't leave it all to teachers who are incredibly uh, busy. We're also, by the way, sir, working in pupil referral units to make sure children aren't written off at an early age. Uh, I genuinely think if young people are given a helping hand, they can have their potential fulfilled. Uh, I was blessed with great teachers and youth clubs when I was growing up. Too many young people haven't got the youth clubs, the facilities around them to give them the uh, support. And the final point, and I know time is short, is without excusing criminality, uh, there are complex reasons why crime occurs. Uh, deprivation, uh, social alienation, uh, lack of opportunity, and those root causes have been made worse by this pandemic. That's why we've got to invest in our young people rather than writing off young people. Thank you. And Assemblymember Devonish wanted to come in on the back of that. Thank you very much. Did you, did, did you want to respond to that? Well, I think uh, Tony Devonish forgets who's been in government for the last 11 years. 
uh, who has been responsible for, for 21,000 police officers being cut. Who has been responsible for the decimation of the youth service in London? We have had hundreds of youth clubs closing down, thousands of youth workers losing their jobs, tens of thousands of young people without constructive things to do. Rather than playing party politics, Tony, work with me to help young people. Okay. I have two indications, one from um, Assemblymember Barry. Thank you very much, um, and thank you, thank you. And I, I agree with the mayor there. You know, we've seen so many public services squeeze, so many that would keep people safe. Now, I'm Sean Berry. I'm a Green London Assembly member, but I'm also a Camden councillor, which is where we are now. And the mayor of Camden, Sabrina, is here today. Um, she chaired a really, really good debate in Camden Council yesterday, where we talked about the practical solutions that we need, the restoration of those services, from youth services to women's refuges, to support for people who are reporting violence. Also, you know, housing that would make such a difference to helping people get away from danger. And it was such a positive um, debate. But I think that the one thing that wasn't tackled as much in that debate, and one thing that the, the, the lady over there raised is that we need to fix policing. Um, the thing that's really collapsed is the trust people have, particularly people of colour, particularly women this year in policing. It's completely collapsed. And we've seen, we've seen today there are going to be more officers carrying out investigations, looking at the vetting of police officers. And I need to see, and a lot of us need to see, the results of those investigations being more police being removed from their jobs. We can't try to change the attitudes of some people. We have to take them out of the police force. And I really think we need to see the deepest, deepest police reform before that trust is restored. And we need to see restoration of funding in all our public services so that we can actually prevent crime and not just see it um, dealt with at a police level as well. So I hope that will be sorted out and I really hope... Thank you. Thank you. Can, we, the, can we keep this The brief? police can be fixed. I, I do continue to hope for that. Okay, thank you. Um, we have exactly four minutes left. Uh, did, uh, somebody member decided, do you want to come in or do you want to wait? No, I'll, I'll you indicated, so I didn't know if it was a, a stale hand or if that was... Still wanted to say. Yeah, I mean, look, this is a complex debate. And the level of homicide in London obviously is very, very concerning. Although it should be noted that, um, 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 that whilst teenage homicides remain far too high, the number of knife incidents that are resulting in injury is far below pre-pandemic levels and has actually been declining since 2018. But we cannot be complacent. As the mayor has repeatedly said, one knife related assault is one too many. But action is being taken. And I would draw attention to the fact that a new violent, uh, uh, a violent crime task force has been set up, 300 officers going around London patrolling, increased stop and search power, uh, stop and search and, uh, and weapon strips, uh, a 70 million young Londoners fund, both enforcement action, but also action to prevent uh, you know, young people going down the wrong road. It's important that we get a positive message out to Londoners that things are being done. We need to reassure Londoners. Yes, of course, yeah, as I say, one knife related as well is one too many, but things are being done. The, I'm a member of the police committee, and I've seen the mayor in action. So let us back our mayor. Let us work together as a community to defeat the, the scourge of knife crime in our capital. And I should also say, in terms of violence against women and young girls, again, I would say the mayor has called for misogyny to be classified as a hate crime. There's something that we from the assembly are supporting. Uh, the domestic abusers register. The assembly supports that. So again, we are putting pressure on the government to make that, uh, uh, to, make, uh, to put that uh, uh, into legislation. So. Okay. This is what the Assembly does come in, working with our Mayor to protect Londoners and give them the reassurance that they need. Thank you. We have just time for one quick last question. The, 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 uh, the guest in the grey top on the second row has been uh, very patiently waiting. But do keep it quick because we have two minutes. Thank you. Okay, we'll do it quick. What you just said to yourself, uh, that issue will work definitely, but there is one issue that you've omitted to mention. We need to hire police forces from the, from the diversity, from different borough, from the different gay, religions, and cultures. What can you do, or what do you do at the moment to encourage people from those uh, diversities to enter the police force? That will have a drastic impact. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to ask that uh, really quick? Yeah, yeah th thank, you. thank you. For that. Thank you for that uh, excellent uh, question. So one of the ideas that the community gave us in the action plan that I mentioned, and uh, 
Dr Debbie Wilkes Bernard is here, who is the Deputy Mayor for Communities, was to increase, as you said, uh, the diversity of our police service, because that would give more confidence to members of the public if the police looked more like them. So we've set a really ambitious target, which is by next year, 40%, 40% of new recruits should be from the black, Asian, minority, ethnic communities in London. We're not just content with recruitment, we're also going to make sure that there are officers promoted, and we're particularly focused on black officers being promoted because there's a, there is a big issue with black Londoners uh, not having confidence in the police service. And one of the reasons is because the police doesn't look like them. And uh, you can't beat lived experiences. And so in addition to making sure our police looks more like our city, we're also working with members of our community to help train the police uh, and be available to make sure our police officers understand the, the issues being raised by uh, Londoners. But I, I understand the point you're uh, raising and the commissioner gets it. Uh, the police uh, get it and uh, we've set a really stretching target so, you know, this time next year, we will be able to tell you how much progress we've made. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. We're out of time for, for policing and safety. Our next session is, a, is about air quality and the environment, for which we have 18 minutes. And the first question, again, on the live chat, comes from Hal in Westminster. Care of open spaces is not part of statutory provision, and boroughs' funds are limited. Therefore, will the London Assembly be allocating strategic funds for upkeep and protection from development of London's invaluable public open spaces? And I'll take two more from the audience. Um, number two, could we take the guest with the black top nearest you? It's just, the, oh, oh, two, two black tops. The one wearing a mask. We're gonna, we're gonna go that way. I know. It was the tiebreaker in the end. Do I need to stand up? I'm going to go for the mask wear. Yeah, Sh go ahead. Should I stand up? Oh. Um, <laughs> um, L London Underground's air quality is the worst of any subway system in the world. Please address the higher than street levels of the toxic PM2.5 particles which form uh, inside the tube network. Failure to publicly address this sends the message that pollution must be confronted, but it's only worth tackling if we can generate income off it. Thank you. Um, third question, can I take uh, the, the um, I just see a hand up, I don't even see who's attached to, nearest number five. Uh, there was a hand up by number five. Yep, there we go. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, I grew up in a town in the Midlands and I developed asthma there. And the air quality there was much, much better than what London's is today. Now, one of your priorities in coming into office was to improve the air quality for London. Uh, so what have you done to achieve that goal? Thank you. Over to you, Mr. Mayor. And then I see Assembly Member Plansky. I'll come to you next. Go ahead. Thank, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Sam. Thank, thanks for questions. And can I, can I, I'll do it in, in the order I was asked. For, firstly, Hal from uh, Westminster. So, Hal, you, you raise a really important point in relation to both preserving the uh, public open spaces we have um, from development uh, and making sure there's good quality open spaces in uh, London. And, I, and I'll take from that you include green space as well. So, so Jules Pipe is here, one of my deputy mayors, and he's worked on something called the London Plan. And the London Plan, think of it as the document anybody's got to abide by if they want to uh, build uh, uh, developments in uh, London. And the London Plan protects our green spaces. So it's not possible to build on the green space unless there's an exceptional reason. Uh, and the ambition is not just to keep the green spaces we have, but to increase it. Uh, London is uh, the world's first national park city, and we've got that uh, accreditation because of the policies uh, we have. And we've got things like policies to green our roofs, to have green walls, and to plant trees. We've planted, by the way, more than 340,000 trees in my first four years, more than the previous mayor in the last eight years. We're going to plant another 80,000 this uh, winter. Not me by myself, by the way. Londoners are doing that uh, with me. But the other thing we've got, which is a new thing that Jules worked on, is a public land charter, which is a lot of public space is in private hands. And so they're allowed to do stuff like stop you having access, like film you and so forth without your permission. So we've also now put in a, a new public land charter, which developers are required to abide by if they want uh, permission. And we'll continue to make sure that we have a city that's uh, open to uh, Londoners. And that's been a particular issue in the pandemic. We've realized the importance of uh, green spaces, public open spaces, uh, and uh, nature. And so it really, it really is important to us. We've got, a, I think, a world-leading environment strategy uh, that Shirley Rodriguez has worked on around this area. 
Regarding the question about uh, particulate matter on the uh, underground, so I've, I was, I've been concerned about this uh, because if you think about our underground, it's the oldest underground in the world, 150 years old, right? So there must be all sorts of stuff down there. Uh, so we've asked uh, universities and experts to look at what's down there to see how dangerous it is, particularly in relation to particulate matter. The good news is, no, no reason to worry in relation to particulate matter, but we are asking experts to look at what more needs to be done to make sure we clean up some tubes that are older than others. Uh, we've got, we've got ext extractor equipment, cleaning facilities taking place to make sure the underground is safe and it is safe, uh, but we're not complacent, and that's why we continue to ask experts to mark our homework uh, to make sure that any improvements that can be made can, uh, are, but there, is, there are no concerns in relation to particulate matter, far more particulate matter concerns, nitrogen dioxide, uh, nitrogen oxide uh, uh, caused by transport, which is the third question asked by the gentleman who originally was from the Midlands. So look, maybe to my story, I, I, um, I ran the marathon in 2014, uh, um, uh, and I discovered a few months afterwards, that as, as a consequence of training in the streets of London, I uh, got asthma as an adult. Uh, uh, so directly because of the poor quality area in London. And you can't see it. If we were speaking in the 50s, you'd see the great smog. Uh, you could see the pollution. And brave politicians in the 50s, uh, because of the great smog, decided to remove power stations from the centre of our cities, think of Tate, think of Ballis Power Station, and move them outside cities because it was responsible for the great smog. The problem is we can't see the particular matter. We can't see the NOx. We can't see the nitrogen oxide, but it's there. And that's why you have some world-leading policies in uh, uh, London, and I'm really pleased we've got cross-party support from at least the Lib Dems and the Greens in relation to some of our policies to clean up uh, our air. What we've seen, sir, in the first two years of the ultra-low emission zone before the lockdown began is just in the first two years a reduction of NOx by almost 50%, a reduction of particulate matter by almost uh, 27%, and a reduction of carbon by 6%. And let me tell you two amazing numbers. The number of homes in areas where the air was unlawful reduced by 94% from more than 2 million to 116,000. The number of schools in areas where the air was unlawful reduced from 455 to 14, a reduction of 97%. That's the difference we're making in London. That's why I don't apologize for expanding the ULES uh, 18 times the size of it currently is. It's now double the size of uh, Paris because I want all Londoners to breathe uh, clean air, not just those that live in the sea charge area. Thank you. I had an indication. Assemblymember Polanski. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, I think I should say it's fantastic to hear the Mayor of London talking about air quality in that way. I'm a new Assembly member for the Green Party. And I'm, I'm really excited by how these are becoming national conversations now. And I'm following in the work of my colleague, Sean Berry, who's had brilliant ideas on this for ages. And I want to acknowledge that the mayor keeps acknowledging Sean and co-opting some of her ideas. And that's welcome. We enjoy our ideas being stolen. We've got some more if he wants them. Um, <laughs> As chair of the Environment Committee, I've been really pleased with some of the work we've been doing, particularly on flooding, but also looking at air quality. In fact, I went to COP26 recently because we've got this twin issue of a climate emergency and an air pollution crisis. Now, with this, the gov government can talk a good game, but we need to look at what this government is actually doing. They're saying that they want to make it cheaper to do domestic flights. That doesn't make any sense. They want to open new coal mines, and they want to spend £27 billion on new road building projects. This makes absolutely no sense in a climate emergency, and we can't let this government get away with this. However, I've had my little loving with the mayor. He doesn't get off lightly either. There's a few things he's doing that I'm concerned about. So one has been mentioned already tonight, the Grand Prix. It doesn't make sense to me that you want to reduce traffic on the road, you want to talk about polluting vehicles, but then you want to invite these vehicles to be spinning around Newham. We know that on car-free day, that lowers the levels of toxic air in London. What's it going to do when we have days and days of vehicles going around on the road? And this is an equality issue, because we know that air pollution often occurs in areas of London with disproportionately diverse, back, uh, diverse people or people from lower-income backgrounds. And most of all on this is in Newham, the Silvertown Road Tunnel. For those who don't know about this, this is a £2.5 billion road building project that the mayor has signed off on. And by the way, this is Boris Johnson's idea, so if that wasn't the first warning sign, I don't know what else he needed. But to build this tunnel in Newwich to Grenham, which the people don't want, is something he seriously needs to consider. 
He talks a good game on the climate emergency, and I'm pleased with some of the action he's taken, but it doesn't excuse this tunnel, which he needs to cancel now. Okay. Uh, Assembly Member Bakari. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to keep it short. Uh, one, we need more cargo bikes. There's been a massive increase in vans because of online deliveries during the pandemic. Two, and this is a successful Liberal Democrat motion that's just been passed, we need to have an awareness campaign on wood-burning stoves. Did you know that one wood-burning stove emits 750 times more particulate pollution than an HGV? And finally, yes, I totally agree. Liberal Democrats say no to the Silvertown Tunnel. Thank you. Okay, and Assembly Member Cooper. Thank, thanks very much, Chair. Um, one of the things that the Mayor didn't say was when he was first elected to City Hall in May 2016, was he found a report that had been hidden away by the previous Mayor, who I think has got some new job um, that you probably all have noticed. Um, and that was actually showing um, the scale of the problem and how it hits our children. The air quality is a problem for us all. I mean, the Mayor has just talked about how he ran the marathon and um, developed um, adult onset asthma. But as a constituency member, I go into schools, into primary schools, and I ask children to put their hands up. Almost every single child in schools that are very near to roads will, uh, will be putting their hands up to say that they're using asthma inhalers. So it's absolutely critical that we do do something about this. And so introducing first the toxicity charge, um, and then uh, the low emission bus zones, and then uh, the central London ultra low emission zone, the ULES, and now expanding it, is critical for children's health, but also older people's health. And there's now been research that has shown that there's a bad interface, not just between people who are poorer, but also people who are older and people who come from different, different um, minority ethnic communities, but also with poor air and a bad response to COVID. So we really do need to tackle this, and that's why the mayor has been doing so much around all of these fronts to try and tackle it and calling for a new Clean Air Act. It's not just a London problem, it does affect other cities as well, but it is much worse in London because of the number particularly um, of you know, private cars on the road. So trying to encourage people out of the more polluting vehicles and having scrappage schemes, we do understand how difficult some of this change is. Change is always unwelcome, nobody really wants to change, but there are changes that we really need to make for the sake of our children, to give our children health and life going into the future. And that's also why there's so much in the London plan about open spaces. During COVID, so many people came to rely on being able to get out into open spaces. And it is an absolute boom that we have so much open space in the city. And I would also like to congratulate the mayor for declaring London to be a national park city. I think it's a great initiative. We should all be using our open spaces and protecting and loving them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have... We have five minutes left, so I'm going to take two very quick questions. Um, there's lots of hands going up. I'm going to take uh, nearest number three with the ribbed jumper, just there, third row back. Um, you go ahead. Um, in view of... Um, the failure of COP26 and the... Oh, it's okay. Don't worry about it, thank you. <laughs> can we take, um, can we remain, sit remain seating? I'm not gonna call, if you're, if you're standing or waving objects at me, I won't call on you. Um, could we take a question from the, uh, the, the guest nearest three with a face mask on? If you wear a face mask, it's um, on my corny. <laughs> Will the mayor agree to consult with boroughs about monitoring the number of child deaths, child admissions to hospitals caused by air pollution, air pollution so month by month we can hopefully track your policies improving the life of the most vulnerable children in London. Okay. And one very quick final question. Um, let's take from, I'll take the, the, the black top without a mask. Go on. 
I've got a mask, thank you. Um, <laughs> Mr Mayor, one of the issues that you've raised is obviously the number of rapid charge points on the road, which go a long way to cleaning up air. Um, the taxi industry in London is currently investing three and a quarter million pounds a week in new electric vehicles. You've installed 450 rapid charge points, all on TfL's network. The boroughs, some have been better than others, and some have been absolutely atrocious. What can you and the Assembly members do to encourage the boroughs to follow your lead and install more charge points? Ironically, we're in Camden this afternoon or this evening. They're one of the worst boroughs. I think they've got two or possibly three RCPs. Some boroughs like Southwark have installed 20 and 25. What can you do to encourage the, and what can the other assembly members do so to want, encourage their boroughs? Uh, thank you. Uh, and can I, firstly, thank you for the question, sir, in relation to how we monitor how good or bad the air is. So one of the first things I did, sir, was I, I, because I ma made the point to the gentleman from, originally from the Midlands, who's now a Londoner, uh, um, is you can't see this stuff. So we need to monitor how good or bad the air is. So working with partners like um, Bloomberg Philanthropies and uh, uh, other groups involved with uh, uh, international organisations, we have in London now the largest number of air quality monitors of any city in the world. And these air quality monitors are installed across our city, including outside schools, outside hospitals, outside GP practices, to monitor in real time how good or bad uh, the air is. So we're going to be able to see whether uh, policies are making a, uh, a difference. Or, and it's all public. You can go into a website and see uh, what the air quality is in your particular area, including where you're from. And so it's really important we monitor this. Look, if you had, if you've got hay fever, right, you're told when the pollen count is, so you can take action. And why aren't we told when the air quality is bad so you can take action? And that's why it's really important to make sure, uh, to make sure people are, are, are aware. Uh, the next question uh, from uh, the front, can I just, just make this point? Uh, the question was from S Steve McNamara from the London Taxi Driver Association. C can I commend uh, the way Mr. McNamara, so he, he, he's unhappy with some of our policies, but he's challenging me in, in a way that I think should be done in a democracy about how you know, he's holding me to account in a way that's not uh, 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 inciting hatred, it's not aggressive. Uh, and you're not having to be you know, taken up for being disruptive. And I, I'm grateful, Mr. McNamara, for, for the way you're holding me to account. And you raise a really important point. The point you make is we've got to make sure that your members have got confidence about rapid charging points, because how can they buy a car that's electric and then worry they're going to run out of fuel whilst they're doing a day's work? And the same challenge is raised by plumbers, electricians, and others, commercial drivers who need to have fuel to do their work, to get the money to put food on the table and pay for the roof over their uh, heads. So we have, you're right, and thanks for giving us credit, we have, at, to make, we have used the assets we've got, TFL land, to make sure there's rapid charging points. There's good news, uh, Steve, which is that councils are willing to play ball now as well. The challenge you posed to me is, if, I, if you did a bird's eye view of London, some parts are well served, <laughs> but actually across London, the 32 boroughs, some parts are not well served, and your members are having to drive in, some may live outside London, and they're understandably nervous. We're making progress, and the good news is that the 32 boroughs get it, the city of London gets it. And over the course of the next few months, uh, I, I, I hope to give you confidence that we'll have better coverage going uh, forward. As I said, we should be really proud, and it's thanks to lobbying from people like you. We've got more rapid charging points than any city in Western Europe. I'm not content, though. We need to do even better. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We're now out of time for air quality and the environment. Our next section is housing. And again, I'll be taking three questions at first, and we have 18 minutes for this section. The first question comes from Wayo in Croydon. And he asks, I am a social housing activist, and over the last year, we've seen through the media and the horrific conditions social housing tenants have been living in. Why have you not spoken out on this, and why are tenants going to sleep tonight in disrepair? I'll take two more questions from the audience. Um, people, I'm gonna, could, could we get uh, number five? Could you take the guest? I would call that a lilac top. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I do think some members take, need to take responsibility of the problems these cities faces and not pass the blame across to others or use as a platform to campaign on national issues. You're here to answer our questions, not the government's questions. With that in mind, 
What are the housing services and trading standard services in London doing about rogue league told managing agents who are exploiting and threatening tenants, particularly those with cladding, who are being actively targeted? To be clear, I'm not interested in your comments on what the government and others should be doing. I'm, uh, I'm interested in what you, as responsible members for the city, are going to be doing. Okay. And the third question, can I take um, nearest uh, number three? We have a woman who has about two, three people in. Uh, with the dark hair. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sophia. Nice to meet everyone. Um, I'm wondering what policy or plan is that in place to make sure that the new boat in London are actually up to standard and um, the health and safety of leaseholders are put as a priority. Because as, my, as of my personal experience, I bought a small studio as a new boat and I've been sleeping next to a leaking wall for six months and living under a leaking roof. But my landlord and the service company appointed has not done anything about it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Mayor. Well, look, I mean, f firstly, let me, let me do the, 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 the um, unhappiness from the gentleman about us uh, uh, blaming the government. There's a very good reason for that, which is we're the most centralized democracy in the Western world. Uh, many of the powers we have uh, aren't given to us as they are in other cities in the world. We get to spend 7% of taxes raised in London, New York 50%, Tokyo 70%. So we have limited powers and we use them where we can. But one of the powers we have is to use the bully pulpit of City Hall to lobby the government to bring about changes. And one of the changes we've brought about is in relation to uh, a rogue uh, landlord's register. You mentioned rogue landlords. Uh, we have in London a rogue landlord's register. So you as a potential tenant can go on this register and see whether your landlord's a, a dodgy one who's previously been convicted and got into trouble or uh, not. That's an example of us doing stuff even though the government's not giving us powers to uh, uh, do so. And we'll carry on uh, you know, being flexible and being innovative in relation to you know, working with the powers we have, limited though they are, to serve our, our city. But I'm not gonna apologize for being a champion and advocate for our city, particularly when this government is the most anti-London government in the history of uh, my life. And I'll carry on speaking up for London uh, and holding the government to account. In relation to the question raised on email, uh, which is a really important issue, which is the appalling quality of some of the homes Londoners uh, live in, and I include some of the council homes as well. Uh, and Croydon's had examples, uh, which have been in the media, of shocking, shocking uh, qu uh, quality uh, homes. Uh, and a couple of things to uh, say is, uh, in, is that we have, in the last five years, been using the limited resources we have to bring homes up to a decent standard uh, and uh, there were policies from the government to do that uh, as well, and we're going to carry on making sure we lobby councils and the government to uh, do so. But Tom Copley's here, my Deputy Minister of Housing, he's also been lobbying the government to have a social housing regulator and someone who's going to be an advocate for these council tenants who sometimes it's councils, sometimes it's housing associations. By and large, they're good, they're excellent, but you've got examples where uh, the quality has not, up, not been up to good. And that's one of the reasons, by the way, uh, when I was uh, in Parliament, I voted against uh, some of the policies of the government to remove legal aid from solicitors who would be helping tenants in need of decent representation to hold the council, uh, house association or others to uh, account. It is really important that we've got decent housing for all Londoners. It doesn't matter whether you're a tenant, whether you're a leaseholder or whether you're uh, an owner-occupier. You should have a right to live in decent homes. We'll carry on from City Hall at lobbying the government. In the meantime, we're going to make sure any new homes we build uh, are world class. And what we've done uh, with a combination of uh, the housing powers we have and the planning powers we have is have an expectation that all of the genuinely affordable homes are as good as market value homes. So when you go to a home, you shouldn't be able to tell whether it's a council home, whether it's intermediate housing, or whether it's market value because the quality is that good. Uh, and I was recently, uh, Anna, in some housing with you in Agar Grove in Camden, and I challenge you to find better housing in our country. It's council housing uh, funded by a combination of uh, a great council in Camden, uh, but also city hall money uh, as well. But we need more of that across our city uh, as soon as uh, possible. And Sophie, your question is a really important one, because in my view, uh, the leaseholder system is broken. It's, bro it's not working. 
because you've got leaseholders whose dream of being a homeowner came true, but the experience has turned into a nightmare. Some because of a cladding that's dangerous, and so they literally uh, go to bed keeping their fingers crossed that there's no fire because there's no confidence that the home will be safe. Others because you, people like you, have uh, a, 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 somebody who's, who developed the home or, or who owns the uh, property uh, uh, who doesn't do the repairs required, and you're paying a ground rent, you're paying a service charge, as well as your mortgage. And so uh, I, I know the gentleman won't like it there, but I met with Michael Gove yesterday, who I was really impressed by uh, as a Secretary of State for this area now. I think uh, uh, Michael Gove is not from my party, but I think he gets these issues. And uh, Tom Copley and I had a good meeting with him, and we'll carry on working with him, because we're on the same side here. We want you to have decent housing to try and change the legislation, but to give some teeth to hold uh, landowners, uh, landlords to uh, account. Uh, and so, again, if you afterwards come to Tom, if you just wave Tom, give Tom your details afterwards, and we'll, we'll take up your case, if that's okay. Excellent. Thank you. And Assemblymember Moema. Thank you very much, and uh, nice to meet you all today. I'm the new London Assembly member for Hackney, Islington, and Walden Forest. Um, its government name is North East, but that's not a real place, so those are the three boroughs I represent. Um, I'm also the lead for the Labour Group on the Housing Committee, and I just want to reiterate that, what, uh, to add to what Sadiq has said, it's not just the leasehold system which is broken, the housing system in this, in this country is broken and it has been for a long time and it definitely does not serve the needs of Londoners. So I'm really proud that um, Sadiq has managed to begin a house building program which has delivered thousands of new, will deliver thousands of new homes and thousands of starts in the last few years. But um, also to repeat to that gentleman over there, we just don't have the money that we need from central government to build all of the social housing that we need. We need seven times more of it. Um, one of my passions is the private rented sector, and that is because it is the single cause of homelessness in our capital. A third of people in this borough have, um, live in the private rented sector, and many of those will have lost their jobs through COVID, or they will have much more month left at the end of their paycheck than they did last year. And so those, I really want to see a situation where not just devolving money to City Hall, but also devolving power so that we can regulate for Londoners to make sure that many more people can stay in their homes is really something that I would welcome. And I really look forward to seeing a Renters Commission in the next few years. Thank you. Um, I had some more indications. I have one from uh, Assembly Member Best. Uh, thank you, Anne. And I'm Emma Best, and it says on here I'm from the GLA Conservatories, but I'm not going to sell you any homeware. I'm a Conservative member. Um, yeah, I just wanted to pick up on the point Sen made then about uh, not having enough money and to make sure that it was known that uh, the Mayor was actually given an unprecedented grant of $4.82 billion uh, to build affordable homes, and is still not hitting, especially in Camden itself, uh, the targets that the previous Mayor, was, mayor had. And coming back to the housing standards of what we should expect, someone spoke earlier about disabled bays, and that's so important. And actually, disabled bays, yes, there are some on new homes, but they're not matching up with the accessible units. So actually, we're building a time bomb here where people aren't going to have the parking spaces to match the accessible units. So that needs to match up to make sure people can live in their homes for life. And uh, the mayor actually mentioned uh, access to green spaces from new developments as well. But he didn't mention that his fast track scheme is approving buildings, uh, tall buildings, where people don't have the necessary legal access to daylight. And that is a massive point as well, where the mayor needs to go back to the drawing board in his local plan. And finally, I'll end by this by saying we are in Camden, and the mayor did promise in his uh, manifesto that he would only grant tall buildings where they add to the area. And we currently have 16-storey buildings proposed on the O2 centre. And I really hope, and the mayor probably can't comment on this, I will... Uh, uh, defendant there won't be able to come in, but I really hope he sticks by his manifesto pledge. And should he see that 16-storey uh, application refuses that, because that would be awful for Camden residents. Okay. Um, <laughs> Assembly Member Garrett, you also indicated you want to speak. Thank you, Anne. I'd, I'd like to comment on the question about Croydon, if I may. I'm very proud to represent the wonderful borough of Croydon, um, but it is a borough with some problems. Um, the, the council actually introduced a rogue landlord, sort of landlord registration scheme, and what later transpired was that probably the biggest rogue landlord in Croydon was Croydon Council. Um, the, the, the appalling scenes that were, that were seen on TV of the, the homes that people were living in, 
I, I can tell you some of the, the casework that we've seen, it hardly scratches the surface, actually, of the problem. Um, and the problem is not just the homes that people are living in, it's the constant sense of beating your head against a proverbial brick wall when they try to deal with the council to get anywhere with any of those problems. And I think people tend to assume that all councils are sort of the same. And I think when we're talking about Croydon, the problem is just that it is now an exceptionally badly run council. I think that's, that's, that's the problem. Um, this is why it's ended up going bankrupt and requiring a huge government bailout. Uh, it's why it had a, you know, a series of failed other projects, um, a culture of bullying and ignoring problems, and I think the housing problem Assembly is probably Barrett, uh, one we of... We can keep these brief. So we can, uh, I want to take some other questions. Okay. okay. I, I think that, that is a symptom of, of a wider problem, and people in Croydon are really crying out for change. The question, I think, specifically was why hasn't the mayor commented on the Labour Council in Croydon's problems? Um, you would have to ask him that. Okay. We have six minutes left for this. Um, Assemblymember Bakari, if we can be very, very quick, because I want to do a couple more questions. Yeah, I'm going to be very quick. Uh, the Liberal Democrats have been saying for a while now that we need to l stop letting developers off the hook. And it's not just the government. The Mayor of London can stop developers getting off the hook. Stop working with them. Stop building unsafe properties using developers that have got a bad record already. And 60% of buildings that are going through application have been failing the London Fibre Gold standard. They've said that themselves. So we must make sure that anything that we build meets the golden standard for fire safety regulations and making sure our homes are safe is paramount. Okay. Mr. Mayor, before I take another quick question, do you want to come back on that? I'd rather hear from the people rather than yeah, the absolutely fine. party politicians. Okay. And I'm going to remind assembly members to keep your comments brief. Um, I'll take two more questions. Can I uh, hear from the lady in the third row, nearest number three? Hi, my name is Anna. I'm going to ask you a question uh, in regards to the allocations in Lambon Barrow. Uh, with the COVID consequences, people are now hiding in their homes, but some of the allocations have been wrongly um, put. And the council itself has admitted to some of what, most of the liabilities. So we're representing people that are now being told to become creative. So they're disabled people in uh, uh, temporary accommodation or they've been given properties for life, uh, but uh, wrongly all allocated, which means that... Can you that, come to the question, please? Yes. Yeah, so my question is, would you be able to look into the Lambeth Borough uh, Council, which now they're all hiding behind closed doors, and okay, even thank the you. legal executive can all go can, through to them? Thank can you. I take the question from the, 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 the guest two down from her in the same row? Uh, sorry, the, 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 the person who just stood up. Thank you. So um, I'm living in um, as a shared ownership for a housing association, and um, basically um, they are just interested in money more than welfare of people. And I would like to know if you would be considering stop giving them grants if they actually don't provide affordable housing through service charge, not only fire safety, but like all service charge, fire safety as well and also if they provide squalid uh, accommodation. Thank you. Do you want to answer those, Mr. Mayor? Thank you for both of the, those uh, questions. I'll deal with um, Emma's uh, first. So we, we haven't got the powers to look into allocation of housing by councils, but the ombudsman can. So there's a council ombudsman who you can complain to, you can complain to in relation to allocation of housing. You just Google uh, um, uh, council ombudsman uh, how to fill in the form. Uh, and they can look into issues in relation to uh, council. We haven't got the powers to do so, even the housing committee hasn't got the powers to do, to do so, or the, uh, or, or the mayor. Uh, and you may also want to take legal advice uh, as well in relation to... Okay. Yeah. The ombudsman didn't. No, the actual council. Uh, so no, they've no, reached sure, their sure, own... Sure. A sure, position sure, sure, sure. where they have to allocate after 56 days, no, but it's been a year where they actually know that they made the mistake and they keep these people with disabilities in these inappropriate okay. homes. Yeah. So these people are facing what? No, I understand that. The, the, yeah. what, what, what I'm saying is that we, we as City Hall can't get involved. In a 
Okay. No, 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 no. But if you've got a complaint against the council, you can go to the ombudsman, who is yeah. above the council, rather than uh, the GLA. We simply haven't got the legal powers to do so. We'd be ultra virus if we try to get uh, uh, involved. And next to you, the question from uh, the woman in uh, housing association. So yes, we've got two real levers we have got in relation to the issues you raise. One is the London plan. So for you to get planning permission, uh, whether you're a housing association, a council, or a private uh, developer, you're required to, for example, if it's a tall building, have a fire lift, uh, uh, have sprinklers, uh, and we've got policies in London which are far more strict than any other part of the country. Uh, our London plan is world leading uh, when it comes to the issue raised. The problem is that's for new build, not the buildings that are currently built like the one you're living in, where there are real issues uh, in relation to safety. If it's a fire safety issue, uh, you can contact the, uh, if, you, if you come to the front row again, we'll, we'll, get, we'll put you in touch with the London Fire Brigade who will do inspections in relation to uh, the safety of your building. And the other lever we have is when it comes to us giving grants, uh, we make sure that the development is a safe development and uh, it, that it will be safe. So, we, so both planning and grant, we can make sure new builds. Okay. Thank you. We, we need to move on. We've asked a question. If there's, if there's further questions you'd like to ask, could you put them in writing, please? Thank you, because we do need to get to as many people as possible. Okay, thank you. We are out of time for housing, and we are now going to move on to London's economic recovery. The first question is from online. It's from Rajesh, who lives in Brent. Rajesh wants to know, what is being done to help youngsters impacted by the pandemic to rebuild and progress their careers? And I will take two more from the audience. Um, could we hear from number three? Could you go to the second row and on your right-hand side? Thank you. Um, my name is Pierre, I live in Highgate, um, and I just wanted to ask about economic recovery. Um, I don't think it's something that's really covered. There's been a lot of LGBT um, safe spaces that have been shutting down, so like bars, clubs, um, places like that. What's being done to protect those and obviously encourage more to open up across London? Okay, thank you. I'll take one more question. Um, could I take uh, from kind of right in the middle of this section on the grey top? Uh, does number six want to go? There we go. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, my question is about uh, university spaces and what's being done to support uh, arts and humanities and employment in that sector, as a lot of the funding has gone towards science and engineering recently, and it seems like a, a sector that's being avoided, um, specifically in the social sciences and humanities. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Mayor, do you want to start with us? Thanks. Thanks, Anne. Thanks for those questions. Can I first deal with, deal with Rajesh's question, which is really important, uh, in relation to the impact on young people in particular of the uh, pandemic. Um, we know uh, young people suffered disproportionately when it came to mental ill health. There's a big concern. You could have a generation written off, as indeed many in my generation were in the 1980s, caused by a, a recession and uh, mass uh, unemployment. So from City Hall, what we've done is a number of things to avoid that happening. Uh, we've got something called the um, Good Work Fund. What we're doing is we're supporting young people in future-proof sectors to get jobs in those areas where we know there'll be jobs going forward. Uh, green jobs in the green economy, uh, tech, digital, hospitality, health and uh, social care. What Rajesh, you can do is go to the City Hall website in relation to details about some of the academies that we've set up, which gives you the skills. Uh, and we've got these academies after speaking to employers about where the jobs are. So you're not going to get a certificate you can't use to get a job. The skills you acquire are skills that lead you to get a uh, job. And the other big thing we've done, Rajesh, if you're a young person or an older person who's either been made unemployed or is on the uh, minimum wage, uh, you, get free, you can get free skills training to upskill to get a better paid job uh, uh, as well. And we're doing a number of things across London to support young Londoners in particular uh, fulfill their potential. What we don't want is unemployment or underemployment uh, and we're also working with big business and small businesses to encourage them to come to uh, uh, London uh, and the good news is uh, the, in the last few weeks and months we've been really successful in bringing investment to our city and as our city opens up I'm hopeful and confident we can get more investment in our city which is opportunities for young people uh, uh, as well. The question from uh, the gentleman in Highgate is a really important one. 
But one, one of the reasons, why, why do we love London? Many of reasons. One of them is, the great thing about London is you're free to be who you want, you're free to uh, love who you want, and not, you're not just tolerated, you're respected, you're celebrated, and you're embraced. The problem is, often you need a safe space uh, uh, in relation to not just your cultural issues, but other issues uh, as well. And I'm really proud uh, that we've made good progress after a number of years of decline uh, when I first became mayor to avoid further uh, LGBTQ plus venues closing down. So the graph is like this. We plateaued it and there were new venues opening up, but the pandemic's caused a big problem in relation to uh, many uh, LGBTQ plus venues being put at risk. So my uh, night czar, uh, Amy LeMay, uh, has been working with um, Justin Simons, the Deputy Mayor for Culture, and we've got a special office called the Culture at Risk Office. And we've worked with a number of uh, uh, groups across London, more than 300, to keep them open during this uh, pandemic. Indeed, here in uh, Camden, projects like the Phoenix uh, Arts Club and others, and Spiritual Bar and others have been kept open. And we're particularly focused on the LGBTQ plus community for the obvious reasons. Once it's gone, it's gone right, because the, the, the landowner takes the property back, the landlord takes it back, and it's very difficult to reopen. And so we are doing lots of work in this area because it's really important we don't lose what's special uh, about our city. And it's hospitality that's been affected probably most as a sector uh, by the pandemic because it relies on a footfall. And uh, there's been no footfall. And uh, the great news is uh, this weekend, the night tube is returning on two of our lines, which will support the nighttime economy. Uh, but also we've got a, a really exciting Christmas program uh, let's do Christmas in London. Uh, hopefully you've seen the lights, uh, the biggest uh, lights London's ever seen, more than, more, you know, more, more coverage across our city to encourage people back and that will support the nighttime economy, particularly um, uh, the LGBTQ plus uh, uh, culture at uh, risk uh, uh, sector as well. The really important question raised about uh, arts and humanities uh, and social sciences uh, from, from a colleague towards the back. Camden uh, arguably has more universities than in any borough in our city and more students live in uh, than any borough in uh, our city. Uh, and it's really important that we uh, don't put all our regs in the science basket, uh, science basket as important as it is, because actually what people don't realize is before the pandemic began, and it goes back to the question asked by the colleague at the front, out of all our sectors, think of finance, think of legal, think of accountancy, think of uh, tech, think of um, uh, other sectors in London, uh, you know, HE. The sector that was growing the fastest was the cultural sector. And it's often arts and humanities uh, graduates who've got the innovation in their minds, how to think laterally, uh, how to uh, you know, um, think outside the box, uh, learning for learning's sake, and so forth. That leads to uh, us being a world leader. We punch well above our weight in a number of issues generated by arts and humanities uh, graduates. And so we are working with the HE sector, the universities, to encourage um, you know, more uh, young people to have uh, vocations and careers following on from uh, humanities uh, degree, and we're lobbying the government not to put all their eggs in the STEM basket, uh, but to think about arts as well. Here's the irony. Uh, in China and India, they're changing their curriculum to have more arts uh, in, their, uh, in schools and universities, and lo and behold, we as a country are going the other way. It's really important to have a well-balanced uh, uh, curriculum and to have young people uh, you know, doing degrees they want to do, but also not just the degree sector, but those in other fields learning uh, areas uh, uh, not too early being specialized. It's really important we don't specialize too early. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I had, I had two indications from assembly members who've already spoken. I will allow you to speak, but I'm going to insist you're very, very brief. Assembly member Polanski. Thank you. I will be very brief. Uh, so on the LGBT question, first of all, I want to thank the mayor for his positive solidarity with our community. I was actually a founding director of the Save the Black Cap campaign. Now, not as a Green Party assembly member, just as an active citizen. And um, I'm going to slightly disagree with the mayor, although I agree with the sentiment that once it's gone, it's gone. Because actually the black cap was closed down and developers tried to take it over and they tried to turn it into various things. And a community campaign has fought them off successfully. Now we've not got the black cap open again yet, but it's absolutely vital that those community spaces that are safe spaces for our community are protected. I encourage everyone in this room who wants to get involved to Google Save the Black Cap campaign because it's right here on our doorstep and there's lots to do. And then second, just very briefly before Anne cuts no, me off. No, it's, it's um, done now. I mean, <laughs> done. Okay, I assembly the arts and humanities. Seriously, if it, 10 Universal seconds, basic that's income. enough. <laughs> okay, thank you. Assembly member Garrett, very, very briefly. 
It's all about. De Devinish, I'm sorry, I was you looking at. You called me at, Berry, I thought. I, I didn't. It's, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I called you it's actually all about, Garrett, but go ahead. Chair, it's all about jobs, <laughs> jobs, jobs. The mayor needs to stop talking about things and do things. He cancelled the New Year's Eve fireworks display. That would drive footfall and drive jobs for young people. Okay, well. I will take another question from the back, uh, the lady with the mask and her hand up next to number four. My name is Timabo Wesley. Mr. Khan, you talked about having access to youth clubs when you were a young person. Why don't you want to reintroduce this as you've introduced um, new builds? Don't you think that would be wonderful for young people? Two more. Um, the lady with the scarf next to number two. Hi. Can I this? Hi, guys. Lovely to be here. Um, currently, just shy of three million Londoners are unvaccinated, particularly those in marginalised communities, such as those living below the poverty line, black and Asian and traveller communities. How will you prevent them from being discriminated against so they still have the same social and economic opportunities as their vaccinated cohorts? With vaccine passports being implemented around the UK and discriminatory policies already being implemented in institutions and the 60,000 carers who've lost their jobs, how will you ensure unvaccinated Londoners' human rights are upheld? We'd encourage all of okay. you to please sign the Together Declaration. Thank you. Okay, and the last question I'm taking from, again, next to number two, just right behind you. <laughs> I'm a member of Equity, the trade union. I'm also the chair of the TUC, South East Regional TUC Cultural Committee. I want to know um, what you're doing about the proper spread of arts and culture. We have two documents, Performance for All in Equity and Make Culture Ours in the TUC. The notion is to spread okay. culture all over the country, not into pointed venues, which we are Can we get to the question, favor please? Of. The question is, what are you doing to look at our documents? I will send them to you. And what are you doing to make sure there is a properly funded, properly paid cultural sector all okay. over the country for diverse communities. Thank you. And in that's diverse population places like the furthest corners we, of the country. That's enough of a question. Thank okay, thank you. Mr. Mayor. Th thank you for all three of those uh, uh, questions. The, f the first question uh, from uh, the, 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 the woman at the back. Uh, we are investing in a youth service and actually um, Sean's been mentioned by uh, uh, Zach in relation to good work in between Sean and uh, uh, myself. Um, I think Sean, uh, when I first became mayor, was campaigning for investment in relation to uh, young people and working together, uh, Labour and Greens. Um, uh, we worked on policies to invest in this area. And here's the good news. Uh, the Young Londoners Fund from City Hall has invested £70 million in young people. That's funding 300 youth clubs. Um, across uh, uh, our city. 120,000 young people now kept busy doing constructive things. It goes back to the question asked by the teacher, uh, worried about his students. And separately, uh, we've got a, a funding for £35 million through the uh, Violet Structure Unit, supporting uh, 124 separate facilities for young people, culture, education, sports, keeping young people um, uh, busy. I really do believe uh, you know, investing in young people is uh, worth doing, and actually it's far better in relation to another issue that came earlier on. But the best way to uh, reduce uh, violent crime is stop it occurring in the first place. The best way to have young people fulfilling their potential is to invest in them with youth clubs, youth facilities, and so forth. And this summer, there was a huge outreach program uh, we had uh, to keep young people busy, because we were really worried as the pandemic ended and as school holidays began, you could see idle hands leading to um, things that we don't want to uh, see, but it's really important we continue to do so, and I'll carry on doing so. A good example of cross-party work in uh, Greens, and by the way, Lib Dems also supported us in relation to investing in uh, young uh, people. In relation to uh, the question asked about uh, vaccines, uh, look, um, uh, I think we've got to understand that there are some members of our community, those who are vulnerable, uh, those who are older, who, uh, if they catch the virus, it almost certainly uh, uh, will lead to serious consequences and potentially loss of life. Uh, that's one of the reasons why for many, many months last year they were shielding. Think of those who live in residential care homes uh, in particular. And so uh, I support uh, the government trying incredibly hard 
to persuade those who work in social care to have the uh, vaccine. Uh, if there's any concerns they have, to address those uh, concerns. But think how somebody who works in a res residential care home would think if, because they'd not had the uh, vaccine, they passed the virus onto an old person and they lost uh, their uh, lives. And I make this point, at the moment it is the law uh, uh, a requirement to work, I beg your pardon, as a surgeon to have certain types of um, vaccine to avoid the person you're operating on uh, being passed on uh, uh, something that leads to the person losing their uh, life, things hep B. So it is important for us to look at the science and the evidence, but you raise an important point, which is those who have not received the vaccine could inadvertently be discriminated against. That's why it's important to address the concerns people have in relation to why they're not having the vaccine and then persuade them uh, to look at the evidence there is in relation to the positive benefits of having the uh, uh, vaccine. And uh, the question at the back, we are investing in record sums in culture, by the way. Uh, we've got a, a fantastic deputy mayor for culture. Uh, Justin Simon is doing a great piece of work. I make this point. Every time I invest in culture, the Tories in City Hall give me a hard time and criticise uh, uh, me. Notwithstanding their criticism, I'll continue to invest in culture. I think culture is the DNA of our city. It's the glue that binds us uh, together. I think good shape, good, good culture reflects our city. Uh, great culture shapes uh, our city. Uh, and I'm looking forward to working with you uh, to make sure even more Londoners benefit from the great culture that we have to offer. Thank you very much. We have just time for one more quick question. Um, can I take... Let, let's hear from the, from, from the gentleman with the, the many different colours of stripes. My name is Sachin Newing. I come from Enfield, and my background is Merchant Navy. Uh, I'm an ex uh, sailing chief engineer, and my last voyage was in 1978. I had been an Enfield councillor 1990 to 94, and you, uh, in front of me here, epitomize our national problem. Too many of you lack both the essential and desirable experiences, skill, knowledge, and education to supervise and superintend contractors and consult consultants you employ. So when they make mistakes, you can correct them. Can we get to the question, please, sir? The question is, what are you going to do to uh, correct this deficiency on your parts? I'm not sure there was, a, there was a question or if that, I, I don't know. Can we, can we take a different question? I, thank you. Uh, very quickly, can we, can we hear from uh, the black top on that section, number three? What was the question? What was Um, I go to a London state school and I want to ask how is the mayor expecting economic recovery for young people when we are unable to access the qualifications which we desperately need for employment due to the huge teacher shortages that we're experiencing um, and what is the mayor planning to do to increase the number of quality teachers and then keep them in their jobs? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's all the, the, the time we have for the questions. So if you want to take those. Thank you. Can I, can I thank you, sir, for your question? I think, I think it's a really important question, which is we're responsible for taxpayers' money. It's not my money. It's taxpayers' money. And how we spend it, we need to ensure it's value for money. But also the people we employ have the expertise that we ask them to do so. So we often get rid of contract people we employ. And often the contracts we give, part of the conditions of procurement, is for certain um, uh, key performance indicators to ensure uh, the contract's been given out properly and contracts can be terminated if they're not being properly uh, followed uh, through. And it's really important when it comes to value for money, we hold people to account. By the way, uh, nobody uh, on my WhatsApp group has been given any contracts. Uh, and by the, by the way, nobody uh, I drink with has been given any contracts. Uh, and it's really important, uh, those who've given contracts that are dodgy and those that are corrupt are held to account. Uh, and I'll make sure uh, we do what we can from City Hall to make sure we run a good ship 
but also we aren't scared to call out those who we think uh, are partial, are dodgy, and uh, are corrupt because it's taxpayers' money and it's breaking the law. In relation to the question raised, uh, there, it is a really important question, I'll, and I'll bring uh, the Deputy Mayor, who is responsible for education, to talk about what we're doing, even though we've not got the powers to do so, it's an important issue. Uh, and so what I've not done is, because, uh, just to say, listen, we haven't got powers to do so, we're not responsible for education, we're not going to touch it, because you're spot on. A good teacher can change your life, and good teachers change my life. I went to a state primary school and a state uh, secondary school. I was a governor of uh, Correct Furcroft, uh, the best primary school in the world. Um, I, I was a governor there uh, for, for, for many years, and my daughters went to the same primary school as uh, I did, so I was blessed with great uh, uh, teachers. Uh, so what we've done, and I'll bring Joanne here with your permission, is, is we've done a lot, lot of work to make sure we get help recruitment, retention, including housing, but also the career path to keep great teachers. So I'll bring Joanne in, who will explain some of the stuff we're doing, even though we've not got powers to do so, because your spot on it's so important. Just briefly on that, I think you know the, one of the most important jobs anyone can do is to teach our um, children, and so we have invested. So since um, Sadiq became mayor, we've run a programme called Getting Ahead London, which is trying to improve the quality but diversity of our teacher cohort as well. We've had 300 teachers go through that, and it's particularly aimed at trying to get people into leadership um, positions. We're also doing a scheme with the um, South East London Teacher Network um, to try and get some more newly qualified teachers from more diverse backgrounds in. And on top of that, um, we support some education programmes trying to share the best practice amongst teachers in our city, again, to try and improve the quality of the teacher workforce, which I think are pretty excellent already in our city. Thank you. We'll now move on to the final section, which is any other questions that we haven't, uh, that, that, that haven't fallen into the other categories. The first question, again, comes from the uh, online chat, and it comes from Muriel and Brent, who wants to know, what are the plans to open up avenues for children with interest in creative arts, both in schools and outside of school? Um, and then can we take... Number two, do you want to take the uh, person with the mask? There we go. Thank you. Um, Camden Council this week, I think, gave permission to one of the contractors on HS2 to build a temporary construction college on a site just near Euston, which is going to be demolished in 10 years' time. In 2017, the local MP, Keir Starmer, defied a Labour three-line whip and voted against HS2, and I wonder if the Mayor regrets his leader's change of heart. Okay, and a third question. Can we take uh, nearest number three, the person nearest to you? Hello, I'm Maggie, and I'm the founder of the website propertyguardiansact.com. In 2018, Sean Berry did a great research on property guardianships, and she raised uh, problems within the scheme because there are still gray areas in law that are not protected, and we need law defined by law to, for our health and safety and legal rights to be protected. I live in Hackney and the property we live in is owned by Hackney Council. The agreement between Global Guardians Management and Hackney Council was presented and signed on the same day, on 24th of August 2015. And we started living in the property in September and there recently, last summer, we were about to die when our property was flooded. And when we found out about a building survey from September 2015. It shows all the hazards in the property. One of our housemates was sleeping under a wall of asbestos. This was known by, the Hack by Hackney Council. We, after setting up the website, lost Sorry, can we get to the question, please? Yes. The question is, there has been a research in 2018. Why st it's over three years and why no action has been taken? then we are exposed to health and safety concerns without our knowledge. We just know that we will be living in a hazardous property. Deposits are not protected. There are, they are not HMO registered. There are so many gray areas in law. I have already contacted Sam Moema and Sean Barry on this uh, issue. I've been okay. doing a research for over Sorry, a year, up, and please. I would like to share my research with you as well. My question is, what is the next step on getting rid of these grey areas in law and protecting 
the health and safety and the legal rights of the property guardians to clarify things that are identified okay. by Ms. Barry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, Mr. Mayor, would you like to start with us? Sure. Um, so in relation to uh, property guardians, you're right, there are lots of grey areas with property guardians uh, and there needs to be legislation to clarify and bring certainty to the issue of property guardians. For those that don't know, these are people who look after properties uh, in a relationship with, with the owner of the property and there's a grey area and we need to make sure we provide that and I'm more than happy to speak to you about what more we can do to lobby the government in relation to the issue of uh, property uh, guardians and the lack of clarity and protection uh, there is in the uh, area. Uh, Mural on, 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 uh, online raised uh, the importance of creative arts. I think, sh I think she's spot on uh, in relation to the importance of this. And it goes to the question asked by the colleague from Equity at the back um, in relation to the importance of culture. And so we're doing lots of things here. And uh, we're, we're funding uh, some of the facilities we're funding after school during holidays and weekends. is not simply around education and sports, but it's also around culture. Because uh, we know the difference culture can make, not just to the enjoyment of life, uh, but also to uh, how you think, but also it can lead to uh, careers going forward uh, as well. So we're doing lots of work in relation to supporting um, creative arts, the teaching of creative arts outside of schools, uh, 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 and schools themselves do a great job in this area, notwithstanding the constraints of the national uh, curriculum. In relation to High Speed 2, the question was, do I regret uh, Keir Starmer changing his mind in relation to being in favour of HS, HS2, I think is the question, I'm in favour of Hedges 2. Right? I think it's really important to increase capacity of trains all around uh, our country. Uh, it'd be good to increase speed as well. Uh, but there are problems with uh, the eastern part of Hedges 2. Uh, I think the government needs to work with the council, uh, with uh, Len Lease, with Network Rail and others to make sure there is a master plan for Euston. Uh, also support those residents who will be disrupted during the uh, construction. Uh, I think it's important for the government to do right by the community uh, there. Uh, that doesn't mean that you need to be against high speed too. That means making sure we get this uh, right. And I'm sure with the brilliant MP you've got in Keir Starmer and the great council you've got in Camden, they'll carry on doing their bit uh, to, to ensure that the government doesn't let down this community in and around Houston. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Assembly Member Barry. Yeah, should I? Yeah. So, um, what, what the, thank you very much for coming, by the way. I know you've been in touch with both me and Assembly Member Moma, and, she, and we've, we're, um, this is your constituency member. She's hoping to meet you soon to try and iron out what's going on with the council. Um, in terms of the research that we did, you say it was my research, it was the Housing Committee's research, and I was chair of the committee at the time. So, the Assembly as a whole wanted these things to change. And what happened since then was, uh, we wanted some very simple changes in the law, just you know, a line or two here and there in legislation so that the, the, the Homes Fit for Human ha Habitation Act, the, the act that, that helps protect deposits, the act that bans tenancy fees, all of those things that, that renters have got as protections now can also apply to, to property guardians who have shorter term leases but should have all the same kinds of protections, like being able to bring action against your landlord when there's um, danger and, and problems with the... Um, the conditions which the council is supposed to try and enforce. So we'll hopefully get that fixed for you. But it went into debate in the House of Lords um, and it was quite enthusiastically responded to by some of the housing ministers. But this government has been, I have to say, really just taken over with legislation around Brexit, um, other things that it's been pushing through. Um, like, you know, there's many, many acts that we all don't like now, changing the social care, um, you know, changing the NHS, um, all of the different things that it's been focusing its own legislation on. We've not been able to get another housing bill and try and get an amendment supported okay. through. But we are keeping a very close eye and the, the Assembly always does try Thank to you. follow up on its recommendations as, as fast as it can. But getting anything through this Parliament at the moment is really, really hard. Okay. Thank you. I'm just going to take two final questions before we close for tonight. Can we get a question? Uh, the woman in the back with the sunglasses, I think, on top of her head. Good evening, my name is Paola Berta. I'm originally from Italy, I lived here over 20 years. I would like to um, open an issue here. Uh, basically, I lived in first person a mental problem of homelessness. And I would like to know what is gonna get done about all the abuse 
that we do suffer in supporting accommodation. And why the ombudsman let me down and, and now that you have to do a complaint to the ombudsman and you get moved from a place to another and then another. I'm a professional actress. I haven't been on BBC and ITV and that all my work went down since then. And it's not good. I lost my father last year. Um, my uh, aunt grew me up two weeks ago, cancer. And it's exhausting. And I live with people in our hotel in Bayswater. They stayed there for years. People with mental health. People with all sorts of problems. People that prefer to be homeless rather than live in a very disgusting, if I can say, temporary accommodation. Homeless, street homeless, I mean. Um, I have to put up with abuse from crack and, and heroin users, daughters of people that have to share the floor in some mangoes. They didn't care. They didn't care. They have a rule. They say that abuse is not allowed. It's not accepted in the rules, but then they let you go with it. If you get touched and harassed, you have to put up with it because they don't care. And actually, my friend Sophie, she, she knows what I went through. And she saw where I live. I didn't know she was here. She said, I'm happy to see her. But all I mean is, this, I understand the housing. And the, the Mr. Sadiq Khan, you spoke and you said, there's going to be a lot of investment coming up. But there is something beyond that. All the agony with people with diagnosis, mental health disorders, like myself, people they are struggling and they want to get on with their life and some mangoes they're promoting themselves as like we're going to rebuild people's life and they destroy us. I even had to spend a night in Charing Cross prison Thank you. because Thank of them. Okay. Because I ended up being from the victim failing self-regarding to the person that actually had to defend themselves. You know? So I, I really am asking for me and for the sake of people like me, like my local council in Ells Court, where I used to live, because it was the recovery college at 94 at Cliff Gardens. Um, the good people should not end up being the victims and the bad people, because some people, you know, even if I work at a walk okay. down Ells Court thank, Road, thank I get abused by still the daughter of this th woman. Thank you for sharing. I, I, yeah, it's yeah. about how people are, yeah. why they are. Rebuilding themselves. It's not about getting the house. I, I understand. We'll take a, Can a, we do something? Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. We, we actually have to have to end now because it's close to nine o'clock. Um, Mr. Mayor, would you like to give a, a, a very brief answer on that before we come to a yeah, close? Yeah. Firstly, thank, thank you for your bravery for, for speaking up. It's not difficult with so many people here. Look, can you, when the, when the meeting finishes in a few moments, come to the front uh, and uh, speak to my team? I'll take your details and look at and look into your particular, because I come to the front here when it finishes, I give my team your details and I'll contact you tomorrow to have a discussion about that. So that's, that's, that we'll make sure we, we, we do what we can to see, what we can to do to help you. But, but the issue of supported housing is a serious one uh, that needs to be addressed. There's been years and years of neglect. So working with Tom Copley and uh, Jules, we are now supporting more supported housing. In fact, we had an announcement today uh, because of gov government funding we secured uh, for more decent supported housing for people who uh, need it. So uh, uh, if you come to the front, we'll, we'll try and help you. Uh, and we are trying to make sure there is decent housing. But, and before we finish, can I just um, uh, thank everyone who's made the effort to come along tonight on what's a really cold evening uh, to listen for the last uh, two hours, what's been a difficult, challenging meeting because of people's abusive uh, behavior. I know you've not been happy with all the answers I've given or we've uh, given, but the fact that you made the effort to come along uh, gives me so much hope for our city in relation to not just uh, our future going forward, but the concern you have for our city. You aren't consumers, you aren't citizens, you're active citizens who care about our city. So, Anne, can I end by thanking everyone for coming along tonight, but also, Anne, the way you've chaired this meeting under difficult circumstances has been really, really commendable. Thank you, Anne, for your cheering, but thank you all the people of Camden as well to come on. Thank you. Thank you. It is exactly, it is exactly nine o'clock. This is when we're meant to give the whole back. Thank you again to our security for a very difficult evening. And that's all we have time for tonight. Thank you all for attending. And can I also thank our volunteers once again.
Don't forget to keep an eye on the website for details of the next People's Question Time. And if your question hasn't been answered, you can contact the mayor on the London.gov website. Please make your way to the exits. Good night.